Yeah, man. Hi, everybody. Happy Easter. Woo! Kiddos, y'all come on down. Kiddos, y'all come get some stuff here. Uh, Darren and Miss Valerie have got you guys some things to be able to do while we're uh, going through today's message. You know, while the kiddos are, are getting a chance to grab a bag and go back to their seats, I want to tell you just a quick story. You know, Rachel and I, whenever we were first married, we like to play this game uh, with each other. And that is, she started it, just for the record. And then she would hide around the corner. And when I would walk around the corner, she'd jump out and scare me. Has anybody played this game before? Not a game. I mean, right, it's not a game. It's not cool at all. And so I thought I would give this a go. You know, I mean, she did it to me. So it turned out fair play. I figured it's time for me to give this a try. Well, um, I also kind of figured that she would probably respond likely in some form or fashion that's a little bit similar to the way that I responded, which was she jumped out and I would kind of flinch and then I'd be ready to go. You know what I mean? But not with my wife. You know what I mean? That's just not, you know, not like, anyway. You know, and so, so this was this was this kind of thing. So I thought, man, she's going to flinch first. And then she's just, and then, and then she's oh, stop it, Danny, you ain't got a thing, you know? And I was ready for that, so I'm hiding around the corner. She comes around the side, and I jump out at her, and then she just fists. Sure, she's coming, you know? And so, I mean, I thought, man, there was going to be a little hesitation, zero hesitation at all in my life. She was just ready to rock right then and there. And I was thinking, my goodness, she's a little more of a fireball than I thought she was. And then, a couple of years later, I learned where she got it from. Now, a couple weeks ago, you guys got to hear from my mother-in-law. Those of you that didn't get to hear from my mother-in-law, um, uh, you have to understand, let me just help you understand who she is. She is perhaps the sweetest woman you will ever meet in all of your life. However, the way that one responds to fear, perhaps sometimes is maybe a little bit different than, um, than whenever you, know, you might naturally normally react. So a couple years ago, we're at our family camp, and this is the way my mother-in-law reacted. Whenever I just barely pretended like I was going to throw her in the pool. And now you see my sister-in-law right next to her thinking it's hilarious. Because all of these girls, these McReynolds girls, all respond the same way. You thought she was sweet. My mother-in-law is right back there over there. Her name is Ruth McReynolds. I'd like to introduce her to all of you. She's amazing. Absolutely love for her, love for her, love for her, love for her, and it's, it's fun it's, uh, to see, anyway, the generation. But, um, you know, guys and gals, we all respond to fear in, in, in kind of different ways, and uh, we all kind of have our own way that we deal with that, and, um, you know, we, it, whether it's fear or whether it's danger or whether it's trauma or whether it's um, just difficult situations and all those kinds of things, um, there's no doubt that we all have responses to danger. Now, there's experts out there that would say there's four different ways that people respond to danger. The first is flight, or excuse me, fight, which would be clearly my bride and my mother-in-law. Okay, uh, and then there's then there's flight, which is pretty self-explanatory. Whenever there's danger, you have this fight mechanism, or you have this flight mechanism, which means there's danger. I'm gone. I'm out of here, man. Forget this mess. I'm not dealing with it. Well, the next one is freeze. And so this would be what would happen whenever somebody looks and sees that winning is simply not an option. There's nothing they can do to win this scenario, and so there is this freeze moment that takes place in them. They, they, can't, they can't win by either fighting or flighting, and so they just freeze. And we've experienced this in our home time and again with, with, with children specifically as we play hide-and-seek in the house or whatever that kind of thing, and, and uh, we do a similar thing to what I was just describing. If you jump out and there's this moment, we would see children that there's no fear at that moment. It's just, it's just a stoic body, and then they kind of look around to see how everybody else is responding, and then they respond in kind. So this is the freeze response. And then the last one is called fawn. And this last one is called fawn, F-A-W-N. And what the, the way that this plays out is a person uh, in the moment of danger or crisis or trauma, whatever the case may be, they evaluate the scenario and they see that winning by, um, uh, well, they see that, that either fight or flight are simply not options. And so what they do is they choose subconsciously, very quickly, to remain in the situation and to do everything they can to woo the person who is the aggressor in the situation. It's kind of an interesting scenario there. So there's these, there's these ways that people respond when it comes to danger or traumatic experiences in their lives. Now you may be sitting here going, hey, Jane, that's all well and good, but today is Resurrection Sunday. It's Victory Sunday. Why are you telling us about how people respond to traumatic situations? Well, the reason I'm telling you is because we're about to enter back into the first century. And as we enter back into the first century, please understand the cross was a traumatic moment. It was a terrible time 
especially in those in which we're following Jesus during this time, and then they're realizing, oh my gosh, the person I've been following is now dead. Now what does that mean for me? Does that mean that my life is in jeopardy? Does that mean that all hope is lost? What does it mean for me? So today we celebrate Christ's victory over death. We enter into the first century, and today we learn from a very unlikely source. His name, we know him in the 21st century as Doubting Thomas. And he's perhaps maybe an unlikely source in this narrative, especially in the story uh, as it goes. And so let me set up the scene for just a moment, okay? So Mary has arrived at the tomb, and the stone has been rolled away. Jesus is not there. She immediately goes and tells the disciples who are gathered in an upper room together, in which in that moment, you've got Peter um, and the other disciple who decided to take off running for the, the tomb to find out. And Peter gets outrun by the other disciple. And then Peter then arrives and finds that what Mary had indeed said was the truth. Then Jesus appears to Mary, right? So Jesus had appeared to Mary. And then Jesus appears to the disciples. They had been gathered in the upper room again. Jesus appears to them. But the problem is, is that there was one disciple, there was one follower that wasn't present. And his name was Thomas. In John chapter 20, verses 24 through 29, we read these words. Now Thomas, also known as Didymus, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, they said, we've seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. A week later, so a week goes on, a week later his disciples, Jesus' disciples, were in the house again. This time Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, you see this trauma situation here? you got these disciples who are fearful of the situation. They've locked the doors, not sure what's going to happen. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here. See my hands. Reach out your hand and put it into my side, which Thomas didn't need to do. But he says, stop touting and believe. Thomas looks at him and says, I don't need to touch you. I know you're my Lord. You're my Lord and my God. And Jesus told him these words. He says, because you've seen me, you've believed. And then we look at the 21st century today. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet believed. Now to Thomas, the cross was only what he had expected to happen. He didn't think that there was going to be more going on than what was happening in this moment of the cross. Now, however, Thomas was very devoted. He was a very devoted follower of Jesus Christ. I mean, when Jesus talked about going to Bethany after the news that Lazarus had become ill, Thomas' reaction was, let's all go. If Jesus is going to go and put his life in danger, let's all go and put our lives in danger with him. So it's not that he lacked courage, and it's not that he wasn't devoted. Thomas's problem was he was a natural pessimist. Anybody in here a natural pessimist? Glasses half empty? Any of you guys with your glasses always half full? Right? Optimistic people out there? I know the pessimist people. It's okay. This is just, it's not a problem. It just is. But the reality is Thomas was just naturally pessimistic. No doubt he loved Jesus. I mean, he loved him enough to be willing to go to Jerusalem and die with him when the other disciples were hesitant. They were scared. And so here was Thomas, the crucifixion had happened, and everything he expected to happen with that had happened. He was broken hearted. He was so broken hearted that he responded like a whole lot of people still to this day respond to difficulty, still respond to sadness, still respond to tragedy in life. He wanted to be alone as he grieved. See, Thomas wanted to go be by himself. He said, if I just get by myself, I'll be okay. And so that's what he chose to do. Rather than leaning in, rather than going and being with the people that he had been able to trust with his life for a long time, he chose instead to separate and to go be on his own by himself. He wanted to face his suffering and his sorrow alone. So what happened is, when Jesus came back, just as it had been said would happen, Thomas wasn't there. And the news that Jesus had come back seemed to Thomas 
too good to be true. And so he refused to believe it. Now check out what happened. You got Thomas, who in this moment, his response is, you know what, this is terrible, this is awful. I'm going to go be by myself. I'm going to go do this thing on my own. And as a result of that, the people that he used to be able to trust with everything. Do you see what happened? He no longer believed what they were saying to be true. He, would, he refused to believe that what they're saying about Jesus' resurrection could indeed be true. This is where we get the phrase, hurt people, hurt people. Hurt people, hurt people. Not intentionally. Thomas was not intentionally being this way. This was all out of a reaction to a terribly traumatic moment. But here was, here was Thomas saying, I will never believe that Jesus had risen from the dead until I can see and touch where the nails had been in his body. What ended up happening was another week had to elapse where Thomas didn't know for sure. He'd been told the other disciples got to see Jesus. Thomas didn't get to see. And then a week went by. Now, a week later, Thomas was there. And as Jesus entered in, the door's locked and Jesus all of a sudden appears. Can you imagine? Talk about wetting your pants, right? I mean, gosh, amazing. Here's, here's Jesus. He shows up. And Jesus then repeats Thomas' own words and he invites him to do exactly what Thomas had demanded of his friends. And Thomas, his heart immediately turned in this moment. And he ran in love and devotion and all he could say was I don't need to touch. He says, my Lord and my God. Jesus simply looks at Thomas and says, Thomas, you need the eyes of sight to make you believe. You need the eyes of sight to make you believe. But the days will come when people will see with the eye of faith. They will see with the eye of faith and they will believe. Now doubting Thomas might have doubted that moment as well because why in the world would they believe something they can't touch, taste, feel, that kind of thing. Why would they believe this? See, God reveals through Thomas in this story, after the resurrection of the Savior of the world, God shows us a response that many people make. Many, many people make. And that is, in difficult times, people often see loneliness rather than togetherness, thinking that it will bring healing. If I could just get by myself, I'll be okay. If I can just be me, think it brings healing. But here's what happens. People miss out. They miss out on so much when they separate from people. Especially when they separate from the church. People miss out on so much when they separate from the church in order to deal with their situation. And because Thomas was not together with the others in this moment, it took much longer for him to see Jesus. It took longer. And because it oftentimes takes so much longer for people to see God when they're alone. We see that in the here and now. How many times have we seen tragedy hits a man? People, they're gone. Difficult times come and they're gone. And the next thing you know, it's like, well, the church didn't care for me during this time. Well, you didn't let the church care for you during this time. We've got to lean in in this moment. Because I promise you, this is a really beautiful thing. I promise you. And here's where it boils down. Right here. Okay, you ready? You are most likely to meet Jesus face to face through the fellowship of Christ's people. This is how we get to see Jesus face to face in the 21st century. It's not magic. It's not this, this mental crutch that we go through. It's not any of these things. The reality is... Is that when Jesus enters and cares for a life and turns a heart towards the things of heaven, it's in that moment that Jesus is alive and well in people. And whenever people have a difficult time and they lean into the people that have Jesus alive and well in them, they are likely to see Jesus face to face right then and right there. This is how it works. It's not rocket science. But when a person chooses to be alone, they miss out. They miss out on the body functioning together. They miss out on the completeness of the relationship that takes place in this moment, which then leads to the most, the, the, the biggest chance a person has to see Jesus face to face and to be able to see, where are you, God, in this moment, right here, right now? 
Everybody, when you let people into your heart, you're more likely to see Jesus through them. When you let people in, we got to let people in. And so today, here we are, Resurrection Sunday, Victory Sunday. Here we are to worship together, to be one, to be united together under the Lordship of Jesus Christ, calling on His name, saying, praise your name for sending Jesus to this earth so that we can live. So today we respond to the truth that Jesus is alive and he's present right here. He's present right now in this moment. Now I'm not, and I, I in no way want to make it seem light of our struggles and our challenges. Because every single one of you, I know, every single one of you, every one of us has our fair share of very difficult challenges. Very hard things. I don't want your life and you don't want my life. I can promise. That's just the way it works. I don't want to deal with the things that you've got to deal with, and you don't want to deal with the things that I've got to deal with. But when we deal with them together, we're a whole lot better off. Whole lot better off. There's a whole lot, there's a greater chance of healing that takes place when we do this thing together than when we fly a Lone Ranger stop. And so whatever your initial response is to trouble, to difficulty, to trauma, it's really important that we get to the truth. And the reality is, you know what? It's really hard to be able to see God. Well, you may not be able to see and to feel this God that is the healer. The truth is this. No matter what's happening in your life, God is present in your times of doubt. When you're sitting there going, man, God, I believe. I know you're near. I got my friends. I'm together with you. And we're talking to each other. And I believe that you're here. But man, help my unbelief, because I'm kind of figuring, trying to figure out why does this happen? What's going on here? God is present in your times of doubt. One of my, one of my favorite quotes, Frederick Beekner says this, he says, Doubt is the ants in the pants of faith that keep it moving. You ever had ants in your pants? You move, don't you? Well, doubt is one of those things. It's the ants in the pants of faith that keep it moving. It's not that doubt is a problem, it's what we do with doubt. If we let doubt lead to loneliness and aloneness, we got problems. But if doubt leads to leaning into the body to see the face of Jesus in relationship, man, we got victory. There's togetherness that takes place. And so while your first response may be to be alone in these times of difficulty, this evening I hope that you can develop a quick second response. But that first reaction is to to be alone. But yet that second response is to lean in to the body of people you are most likely to encounter the one that can do something about your situation. You lean into the people that love you, care for you, are for you, and get to be the presence of Jesus in your life. And it's through those moments that we are more likely, in fact, we are most likely to see Jesus face to face because then we can be we can be reminded or perhaps maybe we can know the truth we find out Jesus really has come to save and if he's not there at the difficult times it doesn't mean he's not there in fact he's right there struggling with you but yet Jesus really has come to overthink, overcome everything we can encounter on this earth and what he proves on a day like today is even death he overcomes it all. And so what I thought we would do this evening, share one story and then we're going to be done. One of the moments that gives proof to the fact that together we have a better chance of seeing Jesus face to face. Now this video that you're seeing on the screens right now is video of a time that I will never forget. See these, those, that light that you see there is a helicopter that is coming in to land and that helicopter contains Clint Neighbors. It contains Clinton neighbors in there. Clinton, Julie, and the kids were involved in a terrible, terrible accident. A phone call I'll never forget. Listening to the other side of Julie telling me, Danny, we were involved in a car accident. And it's really bad. They're, fly they're flying Clint from here to Round Rock. To which immediately there was a flurry of emotion that takes place. Right on the other side of that, there's a number of phone calls made in which gathered the saints at the emergency room. Both campuses descending upon the hospital. Because we wanted to be praying when he landed. 
And as he landed in that, in that helicopter, we wanted to be calling upon the name of the Lord to do a miracle in his life. Because we knew that he was bleeding internally. We knew that he was, um, he was broken in several places. And we knew that we needed the Lord to do a mighty work. He'd already done a mighty work in the fact that he was still alive, but we knew he needed to do a mighty work. And so because Julie called, Julie has an amazing family. She could have just called family, family could have rallied the troops, and their family could have come, and they could have cared for them, and they had done really well. But the reality is Julie gave us a call, and she led us in to the pain. She led us into the struggle. And by inviting us in, we got to call upon the name of the Lord together. And as a result, we got to see Jesus face to face. Because when Clint got on that helicopter, he had a broken back. When Clint got off of that helicopter, he did not have a broken back. Now, come on, right? He did not have a broken back. Now, he still had a broken neck. He still had a broken neck. He still had a spleen that was bleeding. But here's the thing. When he got on that helicopter right there, he was bleeding at such a rate internally that he should have bled out between where he took off and where he landed. But in talking to Julie, she tells the story unbelievably. I want to encourage you to, to hear this story. As she's gone through hours and hours and hours of counseling, working through this, the Lord has revealed to her in this process that as Clint's in this helicopter, here's Jesus sitting in the helicopter next to him with his finger on his spleen. Just holding the blood right where it needs to be so that he's cared for and he's near. And then he holds it all the way when they call it, when, they, when, when he gets off the chopper, and what Clint does, he gets off the chopper and he gives us a thumbs up, letting us know he's, well, he thinks he's okay, <laughs> giving us a thumbs up, and God's just holding that spot. He goes into the emergency room, they begin to do all the things they need to do, they realize they need to do immediate surgery, they try a new thing. Jesus takes his finger off the thing. The new thing goes in. And Clint has since run Ironman, triathlons, half Ironman. Still unbelievably amazing. Phenomenal. Oh my gosh. Blow your mind stuff. Works out. He's doing stuff for people in these kind of scenarios. This defines the rest of their life. But not Clint. We see Jesus is alive. We have to see Jesus. We got to see Jesus do what he does. And because they let us in, we got to see and got to be a part of this story. And because they let us in, we got to be a part of their story. And they got to see Jesus face to face because Julie knew that brothers and sisters, his family, were at the hospital <coughs> waiting for him to land. And she would arrive later because she was flying about 8,000 miles an hour, getting here as quick as she could. <coughs> The church family, I don't tell that story to, to pull on heartstrings or anything like that. I just simply want to give evidence to the fact that when we lean in in the moment of tragedy, in the moment of difficulty, we are more likely to see the face of Jesus. We are more likely to see the miracles of Jesus when we're doing this thing together. Now, this next picture, this is a picture of our Thrall campus. And they're all giving the thumbs up because that following Sunday we let them in on what was going on. They're all giving the thumbs up and uh, because that's what Clint did. And so we're responding. And this was just this, this communication saying, we're with you, bro. We got you. We're in this thing together. See, this is, this is family. This is faith. This is, this is what it means to believe in Jesus and to be a part of something that's bigger than us individually. This is the beauty of being a part of the body of Christ. Now, one thing I know for sure is that as I share this story today, I know that not everybody's story results this way. I know that not every story, because there's several of you that are in this room that you're going, Danny, my story didn't end like that. The person I love is not here today. The person that I wish could be sitting here and you tell that story that you told about, Clint, about him or her, I wish that you could tell that story. But that's not the way the story ends. Here's the beauty of Jesus. The beauty of Jesus is whatever the outcome, no matter what the outcome is, no matter what's going on, whether the outcome is what we deem as positive or what the outcome is what we deem as negative, what we know is that Jesus is present. We know that God is near. And we know 
regardless of what's going on, there is love and God will care for you. The greatest way he cares is through his body, the church. God shows himself. He will show himself to you. He will show himself to me. The greatest way, the most, the most often way that he shows himself is as we live this life together. Together, we get to see Jesus face to face. So what I'd like for us to do over the next few moments is for us just to respond together. And as we think about this, we think about how we normally respond to difficult scenarios. We think about how we normally respond to what's going on in our lives when things of trauma or things of tragedy strike. Do we tend to go alone? Or do we tend to lean in? How does God want to perhaps modify our response? Yeah, right? Maybe God wants to modify our response in a way that He knows that we will have the best chance of seeing the Savior of the world face to face. Because, you know, Thomas needed to have fingers, or at least he thought he did. He thought he needed to be able to touch. But the truth is, he just needed to see. When he saw Jesus, he knew, Lord and Savior. See, there's many of us in this room that maybe we, we kind of run in that. I just need to, I need proof, Danny. Or at least we think we need proof. We think we need to be able to this concrete evidence thing. But the truth is, you just need to see Jesus. You just need to see Him. Whatever's going on in your life, you just need to see Him. I promise you, if you will lean in to the body of Christ, you have the best chance of seeing Him face to face. If you go at it alone, you can totally do it. It's a decision you can make. And Thomas still saw Jesus. It just took a little while. I want to ramp that up a little bit. Lean in to the body of Christ. And so I hope that over the next few moments we can respond. We can respond with gratitude for what we're doing here today. We respond with gratitude for stories like Thomas that help us be able to identify and kind of see how do we respond? How do we respond to this stuff that feels a whole lot like death on this earth? How do we respond to these things when the difficult times are coming? The truth is, Jesus Christ is risen today. And the presence of the risen Lord through faith is right here. Jesus is alive. Jesus is alive, church. And he's here and he's alive in you and me. And today, we get to experience the risen Savior together. Father, I thank you for this time. And I thank you for the beauty of the church. I thank you for the fact that, that Jesus Christ laid his life down. He suffered a terrible death so that his bride, the bride of Christ, the church, can live. Lord, I pray that you will help us, regardless of what's going on, whatever circumstances we're seeing, we can respond to your presence. Because, Lord, today as we ask, where are you? One thing's for sure, we can say we know you're right here. We know you're in this room. We know that you are with us. Lord, as we, we, we ask more questions of where were you in this time of trouble in my life, you will show yourself. Lord, help us along to lean into the people that we know love us deeply because they know you love them deeply and their love for us is your love through them. Lord, help us to lean into the church. Help us to find hope. Help us to find truth. Help us to find the beauty that is Jesus. We love you and we thank you. We pray this through the name of Jesus today on Resurrection Sunday. Amen.